Now we've been together here for a month and leaving <coughs> seems like losing good friends but we don't need to look at it that way because people who practice together and have a fairly long time together usually have connections with each other and I'm sure we'll practice together again. Before we go out into the big wide world where we are supposed to have all these wonderful things happen to us, I'll talk about some of the possibilities of practice in our daily lives and also how refuge and precept will help us. The reason why I always um, like to do refuge and precept at the end of the course is because it is something that we can feel we're taking with us into the world and maybe we can recall it and have some benefit from that. First about the practice. Uh, Need it be said, meditate every day, um, well, maybe it needs to be said. <laughs> um, all of you who have gained good concentration, let me point out that this is the easiest thing to lose. Insight remains. It may go to the back of one's mind like something, some skill one has once learned and has isn't practicing. But the minute one wants to use it again, that skill, it comes to the fore. Inside is like that, but not concentration. Concentration is expansion of mind. And the expansion of mind contracts again if it isn't constantly Reselected, like the tendons in a body and the muscles in a body. If we stretch them in exercises, we can continue to do the exercise. If we stop, it all contracts. So, even though we may not pay attention to any of the insights that we have had, and I hope that doesn't happen, They are again available when we put our mind to them, but the concentration isn't. So it is essential that one figures on two to three hours a day of meditation. Now obviously one may not have the time in one stretch although that is the best. For anyone who has got their concentration together, that is the best. But in uh, life where there is um, um, some other uh, like jobs or things like that, maybe it is not possible. If one meditates two hours a day, I guarantee that there will be no advancement. It will be just keeping that going what one has done here. I can give you a written guarantee for that. And even with three hours a day. With three hours a day there is a chance that one may get a little further. With two hours a day one's going to keep it going exactly what one has done here or this. Concentration is a very subtle mind movement and as it really comes together it needs to be cherished. It is one of the most wonderful abilities that the human mind has because 
as most of you know, from the concentration come elevated states of consciousness. What more can we want? It's about the only thing that will bring us to a complete liberation. So two hours a day will keep you at the state where you're at now. If you do less, not necessary to talk about. If you do more than two hours a day, if you do three, it's possible to advance with the concentration. If you have arranged your life in such a manner that you can do that, wonderful. If your life is beset by a lot of um, duties and responsibilities or an eight to five job or whatever it may be, do the best you can. As you have noticed, one doesn't have to sleep all night. It is possible to use those hours for meditation. If the mind is concentrated, it needs far less sleep. So if the only time of the day that you have is five o'clock in the morning for meditation, well, use it. I'm only suggesting you're going to do what you want naturally. But these are only suggestions. Now, obviously, one does have to have some sleep. It is said that the Buddha slept two hours every night. And maybe we need a little more than that. But nobody needs eight. Not the at our ages, and I'm talking about anyone here. Small children need a lot, but no grown, grown ups don't. And people who have concentration certainly don't need it. Because the mind that is concentrated gets a much better rest than a mind that is asleep. During sleep, we dream, whether we know it or not, because the um, scientists have proven to us that there is a dream. A activity going on and um, some people never have any recollection of a dream but we do it anyway so the mind does not have a complete peaceful situation in fact some people wake up in the morning and think they've been fighting dragons all night and uh, because they might have been having such dreams but in meditation in the concentration the mind gets a complete rest. If you haven't done so already, make yourself a little corner in your house where you meditate. It's a very essential thing to have a little spot which is the meditation spot, if you intend to meditate. We always have a place where we eat, where we cook, where we wash ourselves, where we sleep, and we don't cut that all over the place every day and every night. It stays right where it belongs. The towels in the bathroom, the pots in the kitchen. So put a little pillow and a mat or whatever you need in a corner and leave it there. That's the meditation corner or the meditation room if you have an extra room. And then you decorate it with some flowers or leave it plain or put a Buddha statue or hang up a beautiful picture or just don't do anything with it, but have a corner. And it is very helpful to go there every day at the same time. We are extremely habitually orientated. Now, at home, nobody's going to ring bells, so you're going to have to ring your own bell. Whatever that may be, it may be an alarm clock in the morning, whatever it is. If you can make it a habit at the same time each day, it is helpful. Because one gets up in the morning and maybe takes a shower and has a, a cup of tea and knows now it's meditation time. And then there is that has been planned into the daily routine. Not that oh, today I haven't got the time because I got tomorrow I haven't got the time and 
maybe uh, next week and that sort of thing. Having been here for one month is a long period and uh, been very successful for everyone. So continue that with it, with that habitual meditation. If you have a group or know of a group, go once a week uh, to um, join them or let them come to your house, whichever may be the case. It is helpful to have group support. It's not necessary, if they don't necessarily want to hear anything, it's not necessarily to tell them anything, but group support is helpful, as you must have noticed here. It is helpful. We know that there are others that are doing the same thing. They are having the same problems and the same uh, gains. We feel connected. We have a, a fellowship, even if we don't talk to each other. Or while we're meditating, we certainly can't talk to each other. But it is a feeling that there are others who go along with us. In the world out there, those people who meditate are in the minority. And if we only have uh, business acquaintances or relations that um, think that we are a bit peculiar, it does not help the meditation practice at all. Because if they say it often enough and long enough, we might actually start to wonder whether they are right or we are right. So it is very helpful to have those people around one who don't think we're peculiar at all, who are doing exactly the same thing. We also need noble friends. Noble friends are not necessarily Buddhists. In fact, all these denominations are nothing but, again, um, little boxes of identifications, which are totally unnecessary. These identification boxes bring the, to mind the, not only the diversification that we have and the proliferation that we have, but it also endangers separation. The more we identify with one thing, the more we are separated from another. So noble friends are those who practice purification, purification of their inner being, where mind and heart are constantly watched so that the unwholesome thought and the unwholesome emotion is substituted with the wholesome. Whether they're using Buddhist principles, and they probably would because they might even call them something else, but they're exactly the same thing, whether they call them Christianity or whether they just call them common sense, it doesn't make any difference at all. It is common sense. This is one of the wonders of the Buddha's teaching. It's absolutely 100% common sense. Even though it is totally opposed to what goes on in the world, it is absolutely straightforward common sense. Whom I hurting when I'm getting angry? Myself, of course. I can't hurt anybody else. I can only hurt another person if they also start getting angry because they haven't practiced well enough, that's all. So, noble friends, those that practice. It's very helpful to have a noble friend that may have practiced longer maybe one step ahead, and therefore can um, help one when there are some hurdles. The noble friend is also in the Buddhist tradition, the meditation teacher, and for that reason I have put my address on the bulletin board in the dining room, and if you have difficulties in your meditation and don't know what to do with them or anything that comes up that, which seems um, obstructive, you can write to me. That is the address where my mail is always, if I'm not there, kept forwarded 
and I answer every letter. I have never yet not answered a letter unless it was abusive. That has happened to us. I've had two or three abusive letters in my life. <laughs> well, I have nothing to say about them. But uh, if it's a uh, question letter that's questioning me, I'm most uh, delighted to help. And it, the only thing that happens sometimes that it may take a little longer than what it should because I may not be right there where the letter arrives. So it has to be forwarded with an answer every letter. Um, if you don't need any help, that's fine too. Um, it's a, sort of like an emergency uh, possibility. If you have great success in your meditation, I'm very happy to hear about that too. <laughs> it doesn't only have to be a problem. <laughs> But most of the letters I get are about problems. <laughs> so in your daily life, if you have a group, that's fine. Now at this point in time, I might also mention, just seems to fit in in here, that uh, most of you know, or maybe everybody knows already, I don't know, I'll mention it anyway, that we have had this uh, splendid idea thanks to Patricia who came up with the idea that it would be nice to have a center here in America where my I could teach and where this was a permanent facility not only for me to teach for a community to live spiritual community to live and also people to have self-retreats and where those teachers, those students of mine who I'm authorizing to teach could also teach so that the teaching of the jhanas and the way I present the rest of the teaching will not die with me. So um, Bob and Dixie who live in New Mexico are going to be looking around for a suitable place and uh, if they find one, I'm sure you're going to hear all about it. Uh, it's not something that can be done overnight, but it is, from my experience in Buddha House in Germany, an ideal situation for living the spiritual life from morning to night. We have in Buddha House, at this, we don't have any more room than that, we have four people living plus me, so five at this time. I st stay about uh, seven months of the year there. I could, at this point in time, I can commit myself to be three months in America if there is a center. I mean, there's hardly any use in me being three months at the Holy Redeemer, but uh, <laughs> if there is a center, I can be there for three months. The uh, the ambience of have, of living together and practicing together has I find it hard to see to tell the difference because I've lived in this sort of thing for so long now. Um, well, first of all, there is a, a total openness and honesty towards each other. Um, we don't pretend. We don't pretend to be somewhere where we're not. And we don't judge the other one because we know that the only person who is totally um, perfect is the Buddha. So, yes, it is a it is a feeling of inner joyfulness which permeates the everyday life. And mind you, we've got to cook and clean toilets and write letters and answer the telephone and, uh, and make copies of tapes and all the rest of it. I mean, we don't just sit there with our eyes closed from morning to night. I mean, the place has to run. Um, and we have a very nice garden and vegetable garden and that sort of thing. But there is that 
inner joyfulness that there is this pathway which leads out. And so a vida activity is permeated with that. And there is no, there are no arguments. We are certainly of different opinions, but we don't argue about them. We present our different opinions and then we try to come to a consensus of it. In other words, we don't overrun the minority. We like to, we have a board of um, four people, so we have five in the house, so that's nine people. We have to come to a consensus of opinion. And we've never yet had any problem with that. Everybody practices. Uh, all of them are my students, so they practice a way that we have done here. So I feel from that example, and I mean, they're just very ordinary people like everybody else. I mean, there's nothing different about them. Um, from that example, I feel that such a center in America would be uh, of great benefit also for, particularly for those people like yourself who have uh, practiced for a long time already who have found that this is a way, a way of life. So, maybe it will come together. Until then, a group is important. Now, one reads books. If you read books about practice, which are either the books that you may have my book, or you might be interested in reading the actual discourses of the Buddha. One doesn't read those books just from cover to cover. I mean, one can do once, but that doesn't help anything. That's like uh, looking into the meditation hall and seeing that everybody's sitting here with cross legs. That doesn't help much, does it? I mean, I'm sure everybody in this place now by now knows that we're sitting here with cross legs but it doesn't help them, does it? So reading a book like that from cover to cover doesn't do a thing. What one does with these books is to read one page or chapter, depending on how much there is on a page, and then consider within oneself whether one can actually do that, what's written there, and take it word by word, sentence by sentence, either in a very similar to the way I have used this discourse that we have been studying here, the Samanapala Sutta, sentence by sentence or paragraph by paragraph. That's it. I could have read this Sutta out to you in just over half an hour, the whole thing, a three quarters hour. The whole thing has twelve pages. Well, it took me a good uh, um, twenty-seven days. So, of at least an hour, an hour and a half each day. So, now, this is a way to do it with any of the Buddha's discourses. Read one chapter, one paragraph. Either one, either way. And then practice it. And having done that, and being quite contented that the practice of that chapter has actually happened, go to the next one. Now, of course, if you're curious, read the whole thing through once, but then use it. They are the Buddhist discourses, the, the books, um, the practice book, are for, as a um, substitute for a teacher. So if one has difficulty finding a suitable teacher, a substitute for a teacher. That's what they are. So use them as a teacher. Obviously, they're not able to answer a particular question, but that doesn't matter. Most questions answer themselves. Because we have everything within that's necessary. Everything. It's just that we can't get at it. And the more we remove the coverings inside, the rubbish that's in there, and take it out to the rubbish bin, the more we do that, the easier it is to get at all the answers. We've got the whole thing within. We are already that what we want to become. We just can't get at it yet, that's all. So that's books. 
Watch the mind carefully because it is the one thing that can make you happy or unhappy. Watch it. Be careful with it. And do not feed it any rubbish. Do not allow it to get into negative states. Do not allow it to have contact with too many unpleasant and um, depressing facts which we can see in the newspaper, which we can see on television, which we can uh, see in uh, some of the books which are printed. Totally unnecessary. Why? What for? If the mind is not completely stable already, well, just don't uh, give it that kind of input. We are all careful about the food we eat, so please be doubly careful about the food that you take into the mind. The most important input into the mind states that we have are our own thoughts. Never forget the four supreme efforts. Or, to put it much quicker, the substitution by opposites. If you forget that and don't do it, you're not practicing. You've forgotten the whole Buddhist practice. Everything you have learned hinges on that. Substitution by opposites. Any kind of negative thought, any kind of negative emotion, any kind of thought which is geared towards support of the ego illusion, all needs to be substituted with exactly the opposite. And that way it becomes habit. And when it becomes habit, then it's simple. It just rolls along. Everybody has daily opportunities for practicing loving-kindness. We have so many opportunities because we meet people everywhere. Every single person that we meet is a practice session. Don't ever think that these people are either um, a nuisance or you need them for something or they are um, just happen to be there. They're a practice session. If you don't see it that way, spiritual practice isn't happening. Many people delude themselves that they are practicing because they're sitting on a pillow each day. That is not practice. That's meditation. Practice is when we use our spiritual growth and our understanding of what what it means to grow spiritually in our lives, then we practice. Now, everybody has, well, not maybe not everybody, but many people have one particular person that is difficult for them. Very often it's the one one lives with. (laughs) Because that's the one one knows. And uh, running away from that isn't usually the answer. It sometimes is, but it isn't usually the answer. That's the practice session. That's one's teacher. And believe me, you can't change the other person. The only one you can change is yourself. It's so obvious, isn't it? And as we change ourselves, the whole environment is different. Everything is different. The other person may remain the same. It still changes everything. See, like, for instance, if you are very nearsighted, right? And then you get a pair of glasses, okay? So the whole environment looks different. You've got a pair of glasses now. I mean, everything is exactly the same as it was before. But for you, it's all different. And this is what happens if you practice like that. That the person that is the one that you feel difficulty with, is your teacher. And anybody who has ever done that, and many people have done that, know that this was the real and meaningful and the 
most important thing that was ever learned. Because it means that we learn to love that which we have made up our mind is unlovable. It's only an idea it's unlovable. I mean, everything is, it can be lovable or unlovable. It's just ideas that we have. When we learn to love that which we have made up our minds is unlovable, that's it. We've done it. Then our heart is open. And when our heart is open, the meditation flow, flows. With, when the mind only is open, we can understand a lot of stuff. And uh, if, if we're bright, we can uh, have a good understanding of things. But if the heart isn't open, the practice can't flow. Because, as you know, the jhanas are all feeling. So, using the person that we have difficulty with or we find difficult as our teacher is the most important thing we can do. And if it's a difficult teaching, well, for heaven's sakes, it isn't that easy, is it, to sit day after day and cross one's legs and get tired and sit and meditate again and all that. It just isn't that easy. It's uh, only easy when there isn't anybody in here anymore who can find it difficult. Well, that's what we're aiming for. So until then, it just isn't going to be that easy. And uh, I also find personally that if it's, if it's too easy, there doesn't seem to be any challenge in it. I mean, if it's that easy, so, you know, you just do it and say, oh, okay. It's not interesting. So there has to be some challenge where we can see, ah, yes, this is I have to do. This is some work I have. So we have plenty of opportunity, day in and day out, to use everything that comes into our uh, environment as our teaching. Every bit of it is a teaching. Because the minute you become aware of your own reaction, you know what's wrong. If you then blame the other one, that's useless. I mean, that I'm sure everybody's got that down pat now. (laughs) Don't blame the trigger. It's your own reaction. Now, mind you, there are situations in life, and I know that uh, many people come up against that, where they can't uh, handle it, where they have a difficult situation and can't handle it and become more and more and more negative and just can't get out of that negativity. Well, if such a situation exists, one needs to make up one's mind that... I'm not advanced enough, I have to remove myself until I am advanced enough to deal with it on a level of substitution for opportunity. That has happened to many people and there's no um, blame attached to that, but one needs to be quite sure that one has tried everything one has within oneself to love the unlovable. And if one is becoming more and more negative, well then, one has to admit that oneself is not capable. Not the other one. The other one is just the way the other one is. Oneself is not capable of dealing with this. One also mustn't give up too quickly and too soon, because don't forget that anyone who meditates with concentration even only the first jhana, changes markedly. The mind quality changes and keeps on changing if we also use some of the uh, insights that everybody has gained of impermanence and dukkha. So as one changes, the whole environment also changing with one then the whole situation looks different again. So that is also another consideration. The main consideration is, this is my teacher. No matter what that teacher looks like, no matter what it is, it can be a person that's very unpleasant, it's one's teacher. This is where the whole um, change in oneself takes. If you have friends at home who are now going to ring up and say, 
So you've been away for a month, so what you do all the time? Uh, if that's the kind of approach, it doesn't sound very sincere, does it? But it may be a different approach. They may say, look, could I come over and could you tell me something about it? Well, that sounds better, doesn't it? And if they are sincere, tell them. Tell them whatever you think fit to tell them. Don't make up any stories. Tell them what you yourself understand and can do. It may be an encouragement for others to get started or an encouragement for others to continue. It may be an encouragement for others to take it more seriously, whatever it is. If you can, if you do it out of the pure intention of wanting to be helpful, it's fine. If you do it out of the intention to be somebody, don't desist. It depends on what's inten- on one's intention. Karma or monks, I declare, is intention. Check your intention. If that's a, if there's a intention of helping, please do it. So people may ask you about uh, methods, all sorts of things. It's fine. Tell them about it. If you start talking about jhanas and you can and they're sitting the person in front of you you can tell quite clearly from their eyes that they're getting more and more dubious stop right then and there it's a very particular way of looking at somebody you can tell immediately they look and then all of a sudden their eyes go hmm? oh, yeah. <laughs> stop right then and there it's useless You don't want to convince anybody. There's nothing to convince. The Buddha was utterly opposed to missionary work. And then he answered questions. Hundreds of his discourses are answers to questions. So, answer questions, but only as far as the other person can handle it. And then you can stop right there. That's all. That's, the, that's as far as they, they want to go. That's fine. You, it's not necessary that they are now jump on the bandwagon with you. You don't need that kind of support system. There are thousands of people in the world that do meditate and uh, would be quite happy to hear about it, but there are far more people in the world who don't meditate. So it, it depends. You can use your own judgment on that. The other thing besides sub- substitution with opposites is the mindfulness. Being mindful, paying attention. How does one do that? Now some people seem to have that as a natural characteristic. And other people seem to have a dreadful time with it. They who hear about it and know about it and want to practice it, but it always falls by the wayside. What is it? A busy mind is against mindfulness. Now, one may not be busy with one's with activity. One may have nothing to do, but the mind's busy. And when the mind's busy, there's no mindfulness. The first thing that mindfulness brings about is that one's daily activities, one's daily life, is well in order, runs automatically and smoothly, and doesn't present any hindrances. That's the first result for mindfulness. One doesn't do three things, apparently at the same time, but finishes one thing, and has one's mind on that. When one writes a letter, one writes a letter. When one cleans up a room, one cleans up a room. And doesn't. when one washes dishes, one washes dishes. When one is um, pulling weeds, one's pulling weeds. And not hoping and praying that this work will be over soon, that one can do the next work, that it's too, busy, too, too difficult to do, that one's back is aching, that one doesn't really like doing this. None of that. One just does it. Things that need to be done just get done and no discussion about it in one's mind if it needs to be done it gets done 
And mindfulness means that one stays completely focused on that one thing. And then daily life is simple. If daily life isn't simple, uh, spiritual practice usually doesn't get any time because daily life is too um, complicated to leave time for the practice. So get the daily life in order with mindfulness and then watching oneself. Now watching oneself is necessary for the content of mind, of thinking, and for the content of the emotions in order to substitute the unwholesome with the wholesome. If one doesn't have that kind of mindfulness, one can't substitute. And if one can't substitute, one can't practice. That's practice. So, mindfulness is essential for that. So, the feeling and the content of the mind. Now, of course, if we work, if we do physical work, then the attention on the body, on its movements, helps us to keep focused on what we're doing. One washes dishes, there's nothing to think about. Nothing. All we have to do is use our hands. And if we think a lot while we're washing dishes, it's only because the mind wants to have an entertainment. And the entertainment for the mind then is that what we bring to the pillow and then the mind again wants to be entertained. So it's a vicious circle. Mindfulness in daily life is our greatest support system for meditation and the substitution by opposite. Before I uh, go to the explanation of the refuge and precepts, which some of you have had already several times, but never mind, um, this is your chance to ask the last question if you have saved up any questions this is the time for them I'll talk about refuge and precepts uh, first of all I will say something about the shrine and then about the benefit of taking refuge and precepts on a, on a Theravadan Buddhist shrine you usually find a Buddha statue, which in this case is very small, it's right in front there, because nobody seemed to have a bigger one. Um, this is my traveling Buddha that's sitting there in front. It's an Indian uh, statue, very small, and it's made from sandalwood and uh, still has a nice smell to it. But what we do have is the Kuan Yin. Now the Kuan Yin is actually from the Chinese tradition. And I'm very keen on having a Kuan Yin on my shrines because they don't belong to the Theravada tradition because it's the only female symbol that we can actually use. We don't have any female symbols in Theravada tradition. There are female symbols in uh, Tibetan tradition, Tara. Um, this uh, Kuan Yin in Tibetan tradition is called Avalokitesvara. But in, um, and usually it's uh, portrayed to be male. But in the Chinese tradition, it's Kuan Yin. And so I have adopted her, so to say. And uh, this one here, I, I happened to see in a gift shop in Solving. And it's made uh, in Mexico. And I thought it was very nice. So that was uh, last year, and I got it. Now she is the, oh, in the Chinese tradition, she's supposed to be alive. She has been alive. She's supposed to have been a bodhisattva who was actually alive. And when I was in Indonesia once, I was invited to a Chinese temple for Kuan Yin's birthday. And uh, I was supposed to give, uh, to give a talk for her birthday, because, of course, they don't have any uh, nuns either there. So um, there might have been 600 little old Chinese ladies in that temple. Not one of them could speak English. And uh, so I give my talk in English. And then one of the monks that was there, he translated that into Indonesian. And then the next monk translated the Indonesian into Chinese. 
<laughs> one wonders whatever they heard. <laughs> but it was very funny because they were so delighted that there was a nun there that even while the monks were talking, they were all still looking at me. So I don't know that they were so interested what he was saying. They were mostly interested that there was a nun to visit them. And that was supposed to have been Kuan Yin's birthday. Now, of course, she, in our uh, understanding, she never had a birthday because she is nothing but a symbol for the Buddha's compassion. That's all. Uh, in the Chinese tradition, she's supposed to have been really alive, and it is believed that she particularly helps shipwrecked sailors. And there are many, many stories about in the Chinese tradition where this actually happened, that a blue light appeared to a shipwrecked sailor and that he was miraculously um, saved and brought ashore. And uh, even now, uh, even modern day stories are uh, going about. In the Chinese tradition, there are temples, beautiful temples, only with her in it. Uh, in um, such a temple where she was uh, three times life size and um, in three different positions. No, and no Buddha at all, just her. And the first discourse the Buddha gave is called the Dhamma Chakra Pavadana Sutta. Dhamma Chakra means the wheel of Dhamma. And Pavadana, the turning of. The turning of the wheel of the Dhamma. And this very first discourse was given right after his enlightenment to the what are called the five ascetics. These five were his companions when he was studying with those two teachers and was practicing asceticism. And they, he met up with them, he found them uh, near Benares in the deer park of Isipatana, which is at Karnat, which is very near to Benares. And so the deer park where he gave his very first sermon is symbolized by the two deer. Now the Dhamma Chakra Pavadana Sutta is the discourse on the Four Noble Truths, which you have heard also about or not explained to you and that was uh, given during a whole week and this particular place the deer park at Isipatana has been resurrected by the Mahabodhi society and is very beautiful there's a beautiful temple there which the Mahabodhi society put up there is um, a park again with deer of course not the same ones but <laughs> maybe maybe they're there um, <coughs> come from the same ancestors and you can find this, the uh, uh, ruins there of the Buddha's uh, Kuti and also the place where he gave the discourse, the first discourse so it is very nice to go there and there is also that museum there, very small but where you can find the very first Buddha statue that was ever made the Buddha did not say make Buddha statues he said make stupas and in those stupas put relics of the enlightened teachers. So that is uh, still being done today and was done in the Buddhist time already, but the statues came later because we don't have any photos or anything like that, so that's what we have. So the deer are sometimes on the slide. Then it just depends on one's own imagination how one would decorate the shrine and Elise has done a very nice job on decorating this one. And I like particularly that uh, falling over the cornea looks beautiful. <laughs> a taking refuge. A taking refuge is a very important thing. And particularly when we go out into the world again. Taking refuge means that we have something to hang on to. We have a place of safety. Namely, Buddha Dhamma Sangha. There's no place of safety out there in the world. It's all going by in a very speedy movement. Everything is constantly getting lost. Everything constantly dissolves. Everybody wants something, including ourselves. And it doesn't provide any safety, neither for our mind nor our heart. So a refuge is a safe spot. 
and taking refuge in the Buddha as the enlightenment principle, in the Dhamma as the teaching to get to know that principle, and the Sangha, those who have propagated that for us to this very day, so that we are able to connect to it. We have that connection. Without that connection, we wouldn't be anywhere. We wouldn't know what the Dhamma is all about. The Buddha's words are there, and our understanding is possible. So we take that as our safety, which is our protection. It's the the one thing we can count on to liberate us. The enlightenment principle which is within us, but also our love and devotion for the great teacher, the Buddha. And the Buddha is everybody's teacher who hears the Dhamma. We don't have to find out which one is my teacher and this one's better than this one and this one is nicer and that one is not so nice. It's a Buddha. So we have a great gratitude and devotion to the one who is able to tell us how we can get out of Dukkha. What greater thing can there be anywhere? We all know Dukkha. By now I'm sure we do. We've heard about it often enough. So now we know how to get out too. So there's not only our connection to the enlightenment principle which is within the human heart and mind, but there's also our devotion and gratitude to the one who has been able to give us a clear and straight path, which is only up to us to tread. And that gratitude and devotion is then also to the Dhamma, which is a clear and straight path. Nothing could be clearer, nothing could be straighter. That it's not so easy to do, well, it's a second thing. But it is there for us. So we can have not only the gratitude, we can have the devotion and the commitment. The commitment to using the Dhamma to become totally safe. And how do we become totally safe? Only if we are no longer there to be hurt. Which means the ego delusion is gone. It doesn't mean that this body needs to be gone. Because if there's nobody sitting inside the body, it doesn't matter what happens to it. Only a mind sitting in it. So the uh, gratitude for that, the commitment to the Dhamma, is a safe spot. And then the gratitude to the Sangha, which in this case means those have become enlightened using this pathway and having opened it for us, having kept it open for us. Now, knowing that that is part of our heritage and knowing that we can take that into the world out there gives us a feeling of ease. It isn't all that all fired important out there. The whole world is, you look at the freeway, or at least I look at the freeway and I think the whole world's gone mad. Where is everybody going in such a hurry? What is the hurry? So everybody's going in a hurry, it doesn't matter. It's not that important. We have the inner security of having a pathway which is clear and bright. taking refuge in that way, we can remember over and over again, this is my refuge. This is, I know how to practice. This is my safety. This is my practice. And one of the wonderful things about it is that it will come up in the mind on its own if one resurrects the memory over and over eventually it comes up by itself. One that's never apart from it. It doesn't mean that one can't do other things. Everything else is easy. It's absolutely a hundred percent easy to do. One can do anything. Whatever people can do, one can do. If one has 
a totally different direction which is not connected to the gain and the loss that we see in the world that we're interested in in the world then everything else we do it's very simple so the refuge goes together with taking precepts and the five precepts I have mentioned them and we have uh, also discussed them are necessary to be seen as an avoidance an overcoming a developing and a maintaining so we avoid the bad part of it we overcome our desire for any of it and we develop the opposite and maintain the opposite so killing living beings is of course connected with hate so we avoid that and we uh, overcome our negative negativity and we develop loving kindness and maintain it this is the first precept now as much of that as we can do it is always concerned with the opposite of that which we avoid not to kill means that we are harmless and when we are harmless we are loving the less we can hurt other beings in any manner or form the more loving we become now these are all practice parts please don't um, think that one has to be perfect and if one isn't perfect one can't do any of that one has to practice all of that it's a constant practice if we don't do it constantly we'll never learn it it's like when we started in school and we had to learn to read and write they made us do that all the time and now it's automatic reading and writing is automatic this has to be practiced over and over and over and becomes automatic second one is not to take what is not given which means not to steal but it may goes further than not being a bank robber not to take things which obviously don't belong to one even if they're small and the opposite of that is generosity giving so we avoid taking and we develop giving the more we give the more we do not hold on to this supposed safety for ourselves through material goods so that supposed safety of keeping ourselves shut off because we don't want to give love because somebody might not appreciate it that's the supposed safety we have none of that it has any reality to it it's totally unsafe because we're always on the lookout somebody might pierce our armor so giving is the opposite of that one and the more we are able to give the more we have that freedom that we don't have to hang on and grab nibbana is the end of craving so obviously giving is part of the way to nibbana and the third one is not to have Uh, sexual misconduct to refrain from sexual misconduct which is um, hurting another person through physical or emotional um, misconduct but the opposite of that is not just to refrain from that but to be reliable to be trustworthy to be a person who will stand to his or her word a person that one that oneself can rely on but others can rely on a person who is trustworthy to the friends who is um, not vacillating 
but has a clear understanding of how to be not only a good partner but also a good friend first friendship is very important on this um, spiritual path Buddha often talked about friendship now if we want friends we're again on the wrong track we want to be friends the more we are friends the more friends which we'll get so if we can learn to be a good spiritual friend and totally reliable and trustworthy then others will appear out of the woodwork the next one is the one that's most often broken to refrain from wrong speech lying and harsh words but that's not all it's the idle chatter that gets broken the talk which is meaningless talk for talking's sake now obviously we cannot always discuss the most philosophical subject under the sun one must also discuss what one is going to cook but that's not idle chatter idle chatter is when we just talk for no good reason when there's nothing to say and we just want to entertain the mind and that is very often done and so this is the most often broken precept precept it includes gossiping gossiping meaning saying bad things about another person which are totally untrue just to say something and uh, backbiting setting friends against each other by saying wrong things about them right the right speech is a skill that has to be learned it's a skill like any other and we need to inquire into it how much of it we already know and how much we still have to learn it's a skill which is of great benefit in daily life if we are a spiritual friend to other people then we will find it important that our discussions are on spiritual subjects and the last one is to refrain from alcohol and drugs and the opposite of that is being mindful because when we take drugs or alcohol the mind becomes even more confused than it usually is so mindfulness is the opposite of that and it is um, a necessary injunction and you can see from these five which are the basic precepts for living a good human life that in the days of the Buddha the people had exactly the same problems that they're having in California today nothing has changed drugs, alcohol, sexual misconduct what's new? it's all one and the same and you wouldn't have said that two and a half thousand years ago if people didn't need those instructions they needed them just as much as we need them today now to keep those five precepts in order is considered to be a necessity for a meditator and it is a necessity for a good human life and they are the basic precepts for all precepts except now for monks and nuns the third one changes into celibacy but other than that those are the main precepts which have to be kept by everyone and as we take them here together and orally it serves as a support system we're saying it out in front of our peers instead of just thinking oh yes I should keep those so that helps again now if we during the time to come break any of those the only thing to do is to just sit down 
and quietly resolve again to keep that one. That's all that's necessary. Just to make another resolution. These are like resolutions. And as we make these resolutions, we might have to do it again. It's like the New Year resolutions, which we have to take over and over again, sometimes like 365 times in a year. But that's okay. doesn't matter. It's the intention which counts. Now, of course, that's no excuse. When we say, oh, well, I had the best intention, but it didn't work out, that is too easy. We need to consider and reflect. And then if we have broken it, then we need to take it again. Now, before we actually do it, is there anybody have any questions about any of this? We'll put the hands in Anjali. The first thing I'm going to chant is just the devotion to the Buddha, which I won't say in English. And then as I start the messages, you can repeat after me what I'm saying in English. Namo Atasa Bhagavato Arato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Atasa Bhagavato Arato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Atasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Buddhang Saranang I take refuge in the Buddha. Dhammang Saranang I take refuge in the Dhamma. Sanghang Saranang I take refuge in the Sangha. Dutayampi Buddhang Saranang For the second time, I take refuge in the Buddha. Dutayampi Dhammang Saranang For the second time, I take refuge in the Dhamma. Dutayampi Sanghang Saranang For the second time, I take refuge in the Sangha. Hatiampi Buddhang Saranang For the third time, I take refuge in the Buddha. Hatiampi Dhammang Saranang For the third time, I take refuge in the Dhamma. Atiampi Sanghang Saranang For the third time, I take refuge in the Sangha. Saranagamanang Sampunang Panatipata Veramani Sika Padam Samadhyami I undertake the training to refrain from killing living beings. I undertake the training to refrain from killing living beings. Adina Dana Sika Padam Samadhyami 
I undertake the training to refrain from taking what is not given. Kame so micha chara veramani sika padam samadhyami. I undertake the training to refrain from sexual misconduct. Musavara veramanisika padam samadhyami I undertake the training to refrain from lying and harsh words. Sura Miriam Majapamadatana Vera Manisika Padam Samadhyami I undertake the training to refrain from drugs and alcohol. I undertake the training to refrain from drugs and alcohol. Tisaranena Sadhim Panchasilang Dhammang Sadukang Surakitang Katva Pamadena Sampadeta That means, may the taking of refuge and precepts be for your benefit and well-being. What we're going to do now is we're going to do our last loving-kindness meditation together and then we're going to share the merits that we have made in this meditation retreat with all the beings that we can think of. Please put the attention on the breath for just a few moments. Imagine that you have a most beautiful golden lotus flower growing in your heart which opens all its petals until it's fully open. And out of the center of that beautiful flower comes a golden stream of light filling you with light and warmth and love and joy. so that you're totally immersed in those feelings. direct the golden stream of light from the center of your heart to the person nearest you here in this room, filling him or her with light and warmth and love and joy as your gift to that person.
and now direct the golden stream of light from the center of your heart to each person here filling each one with warmth and light and love as your gift to each person here Direct the golden stream of light from your heart to your parents, giving them the gift of your heart, full of light, warmth and love, filling them with those feelings. Direct the golden stream of light from the center of your heart to those people who are nearest and dearest to you, where you have the closest connection. Give them the gift of your heart, full of warmth, light and love. Direct the golden stream of light from your center of your heart to all your friends, particularly those whom you might soon see or talk to. Fill them with warmth and light and love. letting them have the gift of your heart. Think of all the other people whom you might soon see in offices, at work, in shops, in the neighboring houses, on the street. All the people who might soon be part of your life again. Direct the golden stream of light from your heart to each of those people, filling them with warmth, light and love, giving them the best you have to give.
if there's any person out there whom you don't like or have difficulties with, now is the time to let the golden stream of light from the center of your heart reach out to that person too. No obstructions in your own heart. Let it flow with warmth and light and love. Being grateful to that person for the learning situation. Now open your heart as wide as you can and let the golden stream of light flow out of it, full of light and warmth and love, touching people's hearts near and far. First around here, within <coughs> this place, then out into Oakland, San Francisco, the whole Bay Area. All of California. Along the western states, to the Midwest, to the east, covering the whole country with the light and warmth and love flowing out of your heart to people everywhere. Let it flow yet further to Canada, a flood of warmth and light and love, Central and South America, Let it cross the oceans to Europe, Africa, Australia, and Asia. As if the golden stream of light from your heart is a flood of love and warmth and light which can cover the whole of this globe. And touch people's hearts everywhere.
put your attention back on yourself and feel the joy that comes from loving the peacefulness that comes from giving and let the golden stream of light from the center of your heart fill you with joy, contentment and love so that you're totally immersed in them. let the golden stream of light go back inside the lotus flower which closes its petals and then anchor that beautiful golden flower in your heart so that it may become one with it We share the merits of this meditation retreat with all our teachers, our parents, our loved ones, our friends, and our enemies. We share the merits with the devas who have been present and are present now we share the merits particularly with Barbara who's done the work to make it possible and her helpers we share the merits with the people who are running this center and give us the opportunity to be here. We share the merits with each other, with all the beings who may have benefit from these merits. And we let the merits that we have made be shared by anyone who is able to have benefit. I now officially end this meditation retreat. Noble silence is lifted. And may you all be very happy.